Welcome to the Crosslight software tutorial on organic light emitting diode device simulation. Crosslight has many different TCAD tools, but since this is a non-laser device, we will be using our APSYS software. This is the structure we will be modeling today. We have an ALQ3 active region with a buffer layer and dedicated electron and hole transport layers. For this simulation, we will be using our Easy Simio Organic GUI application to create a device structure and all the necessary input files. We start by creating a new layer for our device and setting it its thickness. Since we are going to work with a simplified 1D model, we set the width of the device to 1 micron to make things easier. Another important aspect of the device simulation is the material parameters used for each layer. This includes the electron affinity, the carrier mass, and the band gap. In a cross-light approach, these parameters are grouped together in what are called macros. We have bulk macros that describe the parameters related to the carrier transport, and active macros that control the light emission. The default cross-light library has over a hundred different semiconductor macros, including the most common materials used in OLEDs. To correctly model the device, we need to set the boundary conditions of the problem, and that means defining electrical contacts. Here we have a p-type contact, so we use a shot key boundary with a large electron barrier to align with the HOMO band or the valence band of the device. We finish the setup of this layer by defining the number of mesh lines in the lateral and vertical directions. Since we decided to do a 1D model, we only use two mesh points laterally, which is the absolute minimum you need for FEM method. After applying the changes to this layer, we save our project and repeat the same steps for the next layer.
For our active region, we do something a little bit different. Since there is a wide variety of organic semiconductors available to device designers, Crosslight allows users to define their own material macros. In a Crosslight GUI, this capability is automated and the key user adjustable parameters can be easily accessed. The resulting color of the OLED will be determined by the spontaneous emission spectrum of the active region. A simplified model is available to define this luminescence data, but the best approach, whenever it's possible, is to load tabulated experimental data. This is what we'll be doing here by specifying the name of a text file, which we'll copy to the simulation directory. We see that our GUI now has two new macros containing the data we just defined, so we're going to use these for active region. The new macros are just text files stored in the simulation directory, so it's very easy to edit them later on if you want to adjust the material parameters. After our last layer is defined, we finish up by defining our top end contact. As before, we use a shot key boundary, but this time the electron barrier height is quite small since the metal we use lines up with the LUMO or conduction band of the device.
Some basic parameters for the simulation can be set by the GUI program to avoid creating detailed input files. Of course, more advanced users can edit these files directly if they want. One of the things that needs to be done is initialize the optical model by defining the operating wavelength and the optical scattering losses. For all FinFilm OLEDs, we use a resonant cavity model based on Green's function analysis. This determines the amount of optical feedback produced by the various layers and contacts and controls the overall light power spectrum coming out of the device. Here we assume that the bottom glass substrate is AR coded with only some minor optical loss coming from the ITO layer. On the other side, the top contact serves as an HR mirror and redirects the light in a useful direction. If we wanted to, we could also directly specify the layers of DR coding on the glass substrate, but here a simplified model will suffice. Custom commands can be added in the GUI for more advanced settings. To give an example of this, here we override the electron affinity of the TPD macro to adjust the position of the LUMO band in that layer. The five steps in the simulation setup is determining how much voltage we want to use to drive this device and what kind of output variables we want to generate once the simulation is over. While the simulation is running, we see the simulation output in real time. This will also be saved to a log file for later examination. This is useful for advanced users who want to track the progress of the simulation, spot any convergence issues, or just offer help in fine-tuning some settings. After the simulation, we can plot the results using the PLT system with our pre-selected output variables. This system generates PostScript files, so it's very convenient for batch processing.
As an alternative to the PLT system, we can also use a GUI program called Crosslight View to view the results of our simulation. The first data set corresponds to the initial thermal equilibrium calculations, while the second data set is our device under maximum bias. More advanced settings are available using the full input files if data at intermediate bias steps is, is required. Thanks for watching our tutorial on OLED device simulation. If you're interested in learning more, please email us or apply for a free trial version of APSIS.